In Norway, around 2,000 rapes are reported every year and most are dropped without a conviction. On top of that, 9 out of 10 rape victims decide not to report the crime at all and many report but end up not pressing any charges. This is exactly what happened to one woman in 2004 who reported her rape to the police but was pretty much told to forget about it. Until the next rape happened, and the next, and the next, all committed by the same man. After 21 sexual assaults, the case was the most extensive rape case in Norwegian history, and one of Norway's most dangerous men would receive the longest sentence under Norwegian law. This is the horrifying case of the serial rapist Julio Kopsen. <laughs> everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Elin and on this channel I cover true crime cases that have occurred in the Nordic countries. The content warnings for this video are sexual crimes, rape and domestic violence, so if that's something that you don't want to watch then click out of this video and hopefully I will see you in my next case. Sexual crimes are a pretty sensitive topic, so because of that I'm only gonna name some of the women who have also taken a part in the media and I'm only gonna be using their first names. This case has actually been a hot topic in the media overall this year, since the perpetrator in this case was able to apply for parole in the beginning of this year. So I feel like it's super important to get this case out there, because this man will one day be let out of prison and women all over the globe should know what happened in this case. With that being said, now let's get into the case that happened in Norway. In May of 2004, a girl was on her way to a cafe in downtown Oslo to meet a to her unknown young man for the first time. Her and her friend were going to a job interview and this man was going to be their interviewer. It was her first ever job interview and the job was as a telephone subscription seller. When they met, everything went well and this man was super nice and charming, so the girl decided to hang out with him a bit after the interview. They went for a walk on the streets in Oslo and when they passed Burger King he said you seem like a girl who's not afraid of a challenge. This girl was only 20 years old and she answered of course since she wanted to be a bit cool and tough with this new exciting man. He then said then you can prove it by going into the men's bathroom at Burger King and she just answered really that's it as she thought that this was nothing. So she went into the bathroom at Burger King and when she turned around to show him that she had completed his challenge, he had walked in after her. The man then pushed her up against the wall and started kissing her and she just told him no and tried to tell him to stop. But the more she tried to fight back, the angrier and more aggressive he got, almost like he blacked out. The man then unfortunately pushed the girl into one of the toilet stalls, pinned her and raped her. The girl herself has stated that it hurt like hell and she was crying, but he just told her that if you don't shut up, I'll kill you, so she froze and passed out from this. Already the same night, the woman went to the police and she has stated that the police did not really look after her well. They mainly focused on if she had resisted or not and how she had resisted. As I said, she had passed out, which is common in a situation like this, by the way, so how she resisted should not really be relevant. But according to the police, it was not good that she had passed out because that meant it would be her word against his and she really had no proof. They then explained that if she would file charges and go through that whole process, it would be very emotionally challenging for her. She felt as if they almost asked her to just go home and not think about it anymore, which is just horrible considering the fact that this brave woman went to the police and told her traumatic story. And she literally did everything right from the start, I mean she went straight to the police, so I don't really know why they didn't investigate it more back then. The woman was sent to a sexual assault center for an examination to try to find any evidence and the next day the police called her and asked if she had made up her mind about how she wanted to proceed. She had decided to not file any charges and she withdrew her report. Not long after this, more reports was filed to the police all regarding the same man. In 2005 he was reported by two women and in 2006 he was reported by two more women. The same thing happened in 2007 when he was reported two other times. But unfortunately all of these cases were dropped due to lack of evidence. So who was this man that was assaulting women and managed to get away with it? 
Julio Kopseng, also known as Julio Gonzalez, was born on the 10th of June 1977 in Colombia. As a five-year-old, he was adopted by a Norwegian couple who moved to Norway in 1982, where he grew up in the capital of Oslo. As an adult, Julio worked as a dancer, photographer, stripper, and a fire eater, and was well known on the dance scene in Oslo. He had been in many TV shows as a professional dancer and also appeared in Norwegian talent, which kind of made him famous, at least around Norway. This made him a person with a lot of status and power in the community that he belonged to, and he used this in many ways, especially when it came to women. Julio traveled a lot around Norway and also owned an event company where he promoted different performance jobs. He knew many people and had a big circle and a big network, and his friends described him as funny and charming. And I don't like to put a diagnosis on people, but I think that many of us can already tell what kind of person he sounds like, and let's just say that I had a really hard time finding pictures of him with his shirt on. In 2009, a lawyer was contacted by a girl who had also been sexually assaulted by Julio in October of 2008. This case had been investigated, but was soon dropped, and this girl actually had a friend she knew that had also been raped by Julio, and she wanted this lawyer to help her friend. During 2009, even more women reported Julio, as there would come three more rape accusations into the police. And this was now when the police started investigating the case, as they now realized that there might be a connection between the six dropped cases and all these new ones. According to the head investigator of the sexual crimes section in Oslo Police District, rape cases are often hard to investigate as it's often word against word, usually there are no witnesses and often drugs are involved. The investigation in this case has overall gotten a lot of criticism as it was super slow. In 2010, almost nothing had been done and it would take two more years before the investigation was finished. They found many similarities between the cases. All of the women had been surprised by the attack and had not seen it coming. They also described not even having time to react before the man had full control over the situation. All of the victims actually thought that he had been a likable person who was very persuasive when he was luring them in and then shifted personality as he was assaulting them. The first six cases remained dropped, but charges were filed in the new three cases. In April of 2013, the trial against Julio Kopseng started. Julio claimed that he was innocent, and he brought many female friends to testify on his behalf. These women described him as likable, caring, and helpful, and none of them had experienced anything that would indicate him being capable of committing sexual crimes. And I'm sorry, but that does not mean that he's innocent at all, and I just don't like when people use oh, he's likable and he's never done anything to me as an argument for someone being innocent of a crime. This happens all the time when it comes to domestic violence cases, that people in their surrounding defend them even if they have never been in a relationship with them. I just feel like a friend or sometimes even a family member has no clue what a person is like in a relationship because they have never shared an intimate partnership with them. So their opinions just don't matter and shouldn't matter, but anyway, I went out of topic, so back to the case. The biggest evidence against Julio was the fact that so many women who were unknown to each other described the same experiences with him and there was many witnesses against him. On the 25th of April 2013, Julio Kopseng was found guilty and was sentenced to four years in prison, but some of the sentence was suspended. He appealed this and he was released while the appeal was pending for some reason. The case was super big in the media, and at some point Julio's name was also released in the media. When this happened, many girls started realizing experiences that they had had with Julio, that they had not really considered rape, but now started thinking that something was not right about the situation. The case then took a dark turn when two girls were raped again, and one of these rapes happened when the trial was ongoing. This was a British woman who was on a vacation in Norway with her two children, and the children had been in the apartment when the rape happened. As I said, while Julio was waiting for his appeal, he was free to walk the streets, so he traveled to Spain and also raped a woman there. 
After this rape, he was finally taken into custody as he was now seen as a danger to others, finally. And I'm not sure why it had to go this far before he was taken in. It was now 10 years since the rape at Burger King and this woman now decided to report him again. Since many of the cases were super old, most of the potential evidence was already gone, but they could still take witness statements and go through chats and pictures from that time. While he was serving his sentence, more and more women started to come forward with their experiences and reported him to the police. There were now 18 new cases against him and they were brought to the district court in 2015. One woman called Anne told her story in the documentary that I watched and she was actually a former partner to Julio. Anne had lived with Julio for 9 months after meeting him on New Year's Eve in 2008. She described her whole world falling apart when this case came to light as she had finally gotten back on her feet after their turbulent relationship. She had actually met a new man and was in good shape when all of the wounds were opened back again. Anna was super scared of Julio and did not really want to be involved but then decided to report him after all. She described reporting 9 months of hell and she also testified in court as she wanted justice for what he did to her. In court, Anna described how their relationship developed, and it's not pretty. She was introduced to Julio through a mutual friend, and they were going out to celebrate New Year's Eve, so they had agreed to meet him at a party at Grand Hotel. Julio seemed nice, caring, and cheerful, and also seemed well-liked by all of his friends at the party. There had not really been any red flags in the beginning, and they started getting to know each other and dated after this party. Anna described one incident where her and her friend had visited Julio and he had been all over the place and flirted with other girls. The next day when she went to the bathroom to take a bath, he had raped her friend on the couch while she was literally in another room. Anna did not find out about this before later and went to confront him, but he manipulated her and she ended up believing him instead of her friend, which is something that she to this day feels super guilty about. They eventually moved in together, so she moved to another city, and soon after this the relationship became turbulent. It did not take long before the violence began, and Anna was subjected to rapes and violence for the rest of their relationship. Julio also started controlling her, checking her phone, and she was for example not allowed to be friends with his friends on Facebook, and I'm not sure why, but yeah. Some days he could be super caring and then suddenly he would become aggressive and rape her, so it was super confusing for her. According to Anna, Julio himself had admitted that he was a sex addict and he wanted to have sexual intercourse six to seven times a day. Anna also described him one time filling the tub with water and ordered her to step into this water. It hurt so much that she could not sit down and he then grabbed her shoulders and pushed her down into the water. Julio then sat down and started counting the time and after 10 minutes he said that she could get up. So he was literally torturing her and she was so scared of him that she started fearing for her life. He had also threatened her with a knife and she just knew that she had to get away from him and this relationship. After she left him, she felt super shameful for the fact that she had been living with this man, but she was also fearful as he was clearly dangerous. Julio himself of course denied all of these charges and claimed that he was not a violent man even if they sometimes had arguments. He also described Anna as jealous, possessive, short-tempered and claimed that she sometimes had outbursts. Julio went as far as stating that he was the victim in this situation, as Anna sometimes pinched and scratched him. In his opinion, her motive was revenge and easy money. But there were a lot of medical records that supported her story, for example one medical record from 2009 that stated that she had been punched in the throat and had her head smashed into the wall after an argument with her partner. She had also went to a doctor for injuries in the pubic region, so there was not really a question about it. The district court estimated that Anna had been raped around 300 times, but believed that it was more than that. Apart from Anna, Julia would often lure victims with job offers for movies and music videos, and then drugged and raped them during the job interview. Julio claimed that the reason for the similarities between all of these women's stories was that they had banded together and decided to support each other and that they were false. 
In his opinion, they also had an economical motive as he was famous. Regarding the woman from the Burger King attack, he claimed that they had never even met, but there was evidence that he had been in Oslo that day and he had also been at the cafe that the woman described they met at. So clearly this was just one of his lies. One woman called Victoria was Julia's friend and testified in Julia's favor in the first trial in 2013. She then ended up reporting him for a rape back in 2012 and her story is also very similar to the other girls' stories. Julia contacted her on Facebook as an event manager and they had some gigs together so they became friends and colleagues. She visited his home, learned about his family and met his friends. The last gig that she did with him in October of 2012 was a Halloween show at a club. After the show, they met two girls who ended up joining them at an after party in their hotel. I also want to add that even though it was a party, they had not been drinking since they were performing and afterwards they had bought a couple of beers so they were not drunk. After a while, the two other girls went to bed and Victoria was actually interested in one of Julio's friends. So Victoria ended up going to sleep with these friends and after a while, Julio stormed into the room and started screaming, pulled away the sheets and threw out the guy that was sleeping with the girls. Victoria has described this as almost like a jealous rage and after that she could not really remember everything but he was walking around the room. She then has a memory of herself laying on the bed while Julio was behind her on his knees raping her. She remembers not really being able to move her body but she tried to kick him off with her legs. As I said, she couldn't really remember much from this but the next morning Julio welcomed her, smiled, joked and put his arm around her as if nothing was wrong. She kind of felt uncomfortable and pulled back but he was just too friendly and in that moment she felt so confused that she actually believed that she had just been mistaken about what happened. So Victoria kept in touch with Julio and later testified in court defending him. And to me it's clear that she was just super manipulated by this man and later ended up realizing what had actually happened. In 2015, Julio Kopseng was found guilty on 16 of the 18 charges, including the Burger King rape, the rape in Spain, the rape of the British woman, and the rape of his former partner. He was, however, acquitted for the rape of Victoria because she did witness on his side in the first trial and also since she kept in contact with him afterwards. She had maintained a friendly and even flirty tone with him in the chats after the incident and even if this does not mean that the rape didn't happen, there was just not enough evidence to prove that she was speaking the truth. Victoria has described feeling humiliated and of course regret her actions today and from the documentary that I watched, I just believe her completely. And she appealed the verdict and one day she got a phone call from the investigator saying that they had found a video recording on Julio's computer. It turned out that Julio had actually filmed Victoria laying on the bed visibly drugged while he raped her. The investigators had been able to identify her as she had a tattoo on her back that was visible in the tape. So in 2016, the case was brought to trial again with the other 16 cases that Julio had appealed. And may I just say, Victoria had to sit in court and watch the tape in front of everybody else in the courtroom, which I honestly can't even imagine how humiliating that would feel and I don't know how it's allowed to even happen. She of course felt super embarrassed by this, but it was not for nothing because she became a proof that everyone can react differently to rape. And Julio ended up being sentenced on all 17 charges, so he had now been sentenced for a total of 19 sexual assaults. For that, he has to sit 21 years in prison with a minimum of 10 years, which is actually the strictest sentence that has ever been given for rape in Norway and possibly all of Scandinavia. The court stated that there was a big risk that Julio would re-offend, and the Court of Appeal also brought up that because of his psychopathic and antisocial traits, he will most likely never be treated. Some sources on the internet also stated that Julio has been diagnosed as a clinical psychopath and a sexual safety as he shows no empathy, he has superficial charm, violent and sadistic impulses, high impulsivity and a complete disregard for the rights and welfare of others, social norms and laws. Julio of course appealed this since he clearly still thinks that he's innocent in all this but the Supreme Court dismissed his appeal and he's now spending his days behind bars. After sentencing, the police still received five reports of rape and Julio was later sentenced for two of these. 
So in total, Giulio has now been convicted of 21 sexual assaults against women and is serving maximum penalty of 21 years. The police also agree that they handled the Burger King rape wrong, I mean nobody should feel afraid or embarrassed to go to the police, and they today urge all sexual assaults or rapes to be reported. If you have been through a rape or an assault, you can also turn to a sexual assault center to make sure that any proof of the attack is documented. Julio has been described as one of Norway's most dangerous men and also Norway's most active serial rapist. In 2012, Giulio met a woman, and at some point during all of this, they got engaged. She is around 30 years old and describe him as a changed man today. Giulio has soon been serving his minimum sentence of 10 years and has therefore applied for parole in the beginning of this year. This was the first time that he actually admit to raping the girls, but it almost seems as if it was a tactical move to prove that he has changed. In the beginning of the year, the decision was made that Giulio will not be released from prison and he's today 46 years old. I did also read online that he's frequently being beat up in prison and he's not having a good time there. But that's all that I have for this case today and whew, this was a long case and I'm feeling super tired so I'm just gonna wrap up the video here. Thank you so much for watching and I hope that I will see you in my next case. Goodbye everyone.